Wellspring Church of All Nations presents Screams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stoke. dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and joys of a fulfilling, abundant, spirit-filled, and spirit-led life. Thank you and good evening to you and the Lord bless you for coming to his house on Saturday night. Amen. Uh, can't think of a better place to be. I'm delighted to be here. I apologize that my sweet lady is not here. She's a little, I've been battling uh, some problems today physically. And so she's home being healed. Amen. Because we've been praying for her throughout the day. Uh, she wanted to get up and come, but uh, she's been in the bed all day, and I insisted on she staying in so that she'll be able to be here in the morning. I'm look, we're looking forward to uh, being with you in the morning, Sunday morning. So happy to be in this beautiful new sanctuary. Amen. Have, uh, I don't know, it seemed like the moment that Pastor George brought me in, something unique and special and different that uh, I feel like is taking place in Wellsprings Church and Ministries. And uh, this is a part of it. Amen. You know, on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> we've talked about those scriptures many times and preached about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire that set upon the, all of the people. But one little phrase that really stood out to me three or four years ago, it said, when the Holy Spirit came, it filled all the house. I'd read that many times, but it hadn't really stuck out to me. But it filled, he filled all the house. So I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, has filled and will fill all of this house. So that it will be sanctified and the meat for the master's use, just like the people that worship him here, will be sanctified and meat for the master's use as well. I feel like this is a part of the divine plan. I know your pastors do. But tonight we're going to study God's Word. I want to pick up, uh, as Pastor said, where I left off with you last night, talking about the warfare of the soul. So if you would turn with me in the Scripture again tonight for our text Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, I believe Christianity is practical. I'm convinced that God is practical. And that he it wants to lead us into practicality in our walk with him. By that, I, mean, it, I simply mean that Christianity is something that works. Amen. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's pie in the sky and the sweet by and by, and we're looking forward to that. But it is also a practical, fruitful, successful way to live on this earth. And uh, he has given us the handbook to guide us. Uh, the manufacturer has given us the handbook. Uh, I have trouble when I, uh, we purchase something. My wife normally will have our son-in-law, if it has to be put together, he'll have our, she'll have our son-in-law come and put it together. Because I don't follow the instructions too good in how to put things together. And I can remember a time in my life when I opened this Bible and it it was difficult for me to understand and follow the instructions of the Bible. But then one day, 53 years ago plus, God baptized me in the Holy Ghost. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to, when I opened up the manufacturer's handbook, it began to uh, open up to me, and I began to see how you could put things together in your life. And it's a handbook uh, for how to live the practical Christian overcoming victorious life. Because uh, to understand this book, 
we have to have the revelation of the Holy Ghost, don't we? He has to open it up, but since he's the author of it, he can do that. So uh, having pastored in one church for 37 years, I did my best to be practical in what I preached and what I taught. And I did my best to never get too far outside the middle of the road. Uh, we were fortunate in that we were down in a little town in northeast Alabama that only had 50,000 people in it. So a lot of the uh, way out things that came along through the charismatic movement uh, never did make it, never did get down to Gadsden, Alabama. So I've, I'm grateful for that. But I always tried to stay in the middle of the road in preaching the Word of God and to teach people how to live a practical Christian life. And that's the purpose of this little simple study that I began with you last night, and I'm going to finish, God willing, tomorrow night, uh, the third in the series, talking about the warfare of the soul. Peter, writing to those five provinces, and you read that in the first verses of chapter 1, uh, makes this very direct statement and challenge to us and to believers when he said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. What I want to try to do by the help of the Holy Spirit is to give you some advice and some procedures in your life that will help you to abstain from fleshly lust. I told you last night that the Greek word there uh, for fleshly lust literally is saying to keep you from having a diseased mind. Uh, I believe that our biggest battle in our daily Christian life is not from Satan, although he's a, he's a worthy foe, it's not from demonic forces, although there is a cadre of demons that are arrayed particularly against the people of God. But I believe the biggest battleground that we face is in our mind. Uh, I personally believe that the battle that Jesus had against Satan was in his mind. A lot of theologians believe that, that it was in his mind. You know, there's something interesting about that confrontation that Jesus had with Satan that's the only place that you find in the scripture where Satan came out visibly to confront someone. And I believe he came out reluctantly because the Holy Spirit in that temptation of Jesus in the wilderness was the Holy Spirit was the instigator and the perpetrator of the bringing forth of that, uh, that confrontation because it says that Immediately after the baptism of Jesus that he was led, one of the gospels says he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, but Mark's gospel said he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. So that tells us that the Holy Ghost is in charge of everything that's happening there. And the Holy Ghost, I believe, drugged Satan out from under his concealment and his covering and made him face Jesus in a literal sense and confront him there. And uh, Jesus defeated him just like you and I defeat him, defeat him. And that's with the revelation and the declaration through that revelation of the word of God. So uh, Peter says, uh, you know, I beseech you uh, that you will war, wage a war in a worthy fashion against, uh, the, war, against the war of the fleshly lust and the, the warfare of your soul. Now, we, I won't uh, use some of these scriptures again tonight, but uh, maybe give reference to the First Thessalonians 5.23, as we looked at last night, plainly tells us that uh, we are a triune being. We're created in the image of God, and we are a triune being. We are spirit. We are a spirit. God is spirit. We are a spirit. God is not a spirit. God is spirit. He filleth all in all by, because he is spirit. We are a spirit. We have a soul and we live in a body. Uh, the soul is the intermediary between our spirit and our body. Through our spirit, we relate to God who is spirit. Through our body, we relate to the earth. And uh, whether we walk spiritually or we walk fleshly depends upon the control 
that we exercise in our soulish realm. Our soul is basically our mind, our will, and our emotions. Uh, so our spirit, now, let me pick up and go on. Our spirits were recreated and made new when we were born again. I told you that last night, but it's good that you see that. When you got born again, you were born, your spirit was born again. So you, old things passed away, all things became new. You are a new creation. So your spirit was born again when you got saved, but your soul remained in much the same state. That tells us then that our soul, which has not been renewed and made new as our spirit is, our soul then needs to be renewed, it needs to be restored, and that occurs through the Word of God. Hopefully and prayerfully tonight, there will be a work of renewal take place in, in your mind, your will, and your thoughts as you listen so carefully to the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God renews our thoughts, if we allow it to. It renews our feelings, and it renews our decisions when we bring our, those thoughts, those, that mind, will, and emotion under the authority of the Word of God that lives in our spirit. Paul said in Romans 8, 6, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's the way I want to live. Uh, and I know you have that same desire. Romans 12 and 2, he gives us some advice as to how to do it. He said, but you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So there needs to be a transformation and a renewing of your mind. Last night in lesson number one, we looked uh, at the birth and the lives of two Old Testament brothers twins by the name of Esau and Jacob. They are types, and, and I love the types of the Old Testament. Uh, you know, to really understand the New Testament, you have to study the Old Testament. To really understand the Old Testament, you have to, you have to read and study the New Testament. Because it's not two books, it's one book. It's one great story from beginning to end of the Word of God. And so these types give us insight revelation into the deeper truths of the New Testament uh, as the New Testament writers unfold them to us and uh, give us the privilege to understand and have revealed to us the very mysteries of God. So uh, Esau and Jacob uh, are types of the struggle between the soul under the influence of the body and the soul under the influence of of the Spirit. And that's what we're talking about in order to, for us to gain victory in our warfare in the soul against fleshly lust. Let's go back to first, or rather back to Romans chapter 9 again tonight. Romans chapter 9, and we'll read verse 10 through verse 13. As Paul picks up on what I was just talking about and uses Esau and Jacob as an example to explain some of this mystery. Romans chapter 9, verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. Now, that's a key phrase. I've underlined those words in my Bible. I recommend that you do that. You can't very well do it on your iPad, but <laughs> you can do it. Can you do it? Okay. All right. Uh, but he's talking about election. Remember, I told you election doesn't mean that God has rejected some of the one that he has not chosen. That's all it means. It simply means that he is giving favor to the one that is chosen. You are here tonight because you are chosen. And you responded to that choosing. Uh, and that's why you are a born-again believer. Uh, it's sometimes people uh, make a mystery out of election and out of predestination. The only predestination that the New Testament teaches is that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. 
That's New Testament. But, but God, in his infinite foreknowledge, uh, understands and knows everything because he lives outside of our chronological time in the realm of Kairos time, doesn't he? That lets him, because he is forever, it lets him know those things. But anyway, he is giving us uh, to understand here, the Holy Ghost writing through Paul, that according to God's purpose in the fulfilling of his great redemption plan, he chose to choose the younger instead of the older, and he said that he was going to reverse the normal uh, order of things by causing the older to serve the younger, where normally the younger would have served the firstborn, which was the older. Now we know that Jacob, uh, he, he was part of the elect of God, but yet he was somewhat of a conniver himself because he also was a heel catcher, wasn't he? <laughs> he took hold of Esau's heel as he's on the way out of the moon. And God had to deal with him uh, later on and, and change him from Jacob to uh, Israel. But that's another study. But anyway, uh, remember that when we got born again, our spirits were made new, but our soul was pretty much in the same situation that it was. So our soul then is older than our spirit. But the will of God in the New Testament era is for our spirit to control our soul and our soul to serve our spirit. And if we cooperate and allow that to happen in our lives, then we can wage proper warfare against the fleshly lust that will keep us from having that diseased mind. Diseased mind, will, or emotions. And uh, after Esau saw God face to face, and we read that scripture last night, Genesis 32, 30. You're familiar with that story when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night and he put a, uh, you know, put a problem on his hip, made him lame, and he changed him and he said, you're no longer a conniver, but you're now a prince with God. Change him to Israel. And then after Jacob had seen God face to face, he was then able to confront and face Esau. Prior to that time, he'd been running from Esau. Because he stole his birthright, and he and his mother, you know, connived that. But he had been running, and when he left Laban with all of his children and all of his flocks, he found out that Esau was coming to meet him, and he was so frightened that he put all of his, uh, his concubines and their children out in front, and he kept his two wives and their children back behind, and he sent them out with, with a lot of gifts, to meet Esau because he was still afraid of him. But after he had that night's confrontation with God, he was able to face Esau. And then the scripture goes on to say, and we read it last night, Genesis 36 and verse 6, it says that then Esau left him and that, he, that Esau went to a country away from the face of Jacob, away from the presence of his brother Jacob. Now what does that tell us? It tells us, if we let God work in our spirit, plan his word, and I'm going to be talking about that more tonight, and we cooperate with the Holy Spirit who dwells in our spirit so that our spirit dominates our soul, then we'll be able to confront Esau, <laughs> fleshly lust, face to face, and live in a conquering realm day by day in our Christian life. Now Jacob's hip was placed out of joint, as an eternal reminder that Jacob would always need the spiritual help of God to overcome Esau and cause Esau to become his servant. Okay, having said that, go with me now to 1 Chronicles chapter 18. 1 Chronicles chapter 18. And we're going to read verse 12 and verse 13. Everybody there? 1 Chronicles 18, verse 12. Moreover, Abishai, the son of Zeruah, slew of the Edomites in the valley of salt 18,000. And he put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became David's servants. Thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Uh, Edom now was the place where the, in, 
the generation or the offspring of Esau lived. That was their territory. And now David is establishing his kingdom. Uh, and it was under David's rule that the, the territory of the kingdom was greatly enlarged. But he, uh, this is one of the secrets of the greatness of David uh, in that he not only did he send his servant down there to wage warfare and kill 18,000 of them, but it says he put garrisons in the territory. This, as I said, is one of his, the secrets of his greatness. He put garrison. A garrison is a post or a stationary marker to define limits. It defines limits. He defined the measure of rule for the Edomites. In other words, in other words you can come this far, but you can't come any farther. You're confined to the garrison the standards that I have placed for you. Now, how does that apply to us? Remember, Edom, Esau represents the battle of the soul trying to dominate the mind, the will, and the emotions trying to dominate our life. Our job then today is to make all natural tendencies that affect our soul, make all of them our servants. All of our thoughts need to be made our servants. You understand that you have control over your thoughts? Sometimes you can't stop a thought from coming, but you have the ability and the authority to deal with it. You can meditate upon it, or you can drive it out. The best way to drive it out is to replace it with a scripture or replace it with a godly thought. So it, you, can, you set the standard. You said you, can't, you might have come, but you can't stay there. You can't come any farther. Not only your thoughts, but your desires. If you allow yourself to meditate upon a thought that is carnal or fleshly, pretty soon it will elevate into a desire. James talks about that, and the end result of all of that is what? It's sin and death, isn't it? So not only your thoughts and your desires, your feelings that you have, we are to put perimeters around them so that we control those feelings uh, and our decisions. I have gotten myself in more trouble in, in my lifetime by making wrong decisions than almost anything else that I've ever done. And most of the time when I made a wrong decision, I, it was a quick decision. Had I taken time to talk to God about it, to line up what I needed to know in the Word of God about it, I would have made a quality decision, but I've made a lot of snap decisions that brought trouble into, into my life. So our job is to bring those natural tendencies under the rule of our spirit because in our, the Holy Spirit dwells in our spirit and the Word of God lives in our spirit. We must define the limits for our thoughts, our desires, and our feelings. There's nothing wrong with these natural tendencies. It's just that they must be made a servant to God's Word and a servant to God's Holy Spirit who lives in our spirit. Esau does not understand the principle of serving. He has to be trained. Our soul, this realm, our flesh, doesn't understand the, uh, the principle of serving. It has to be trained. Our soul must be trained to serve rather than to be served. So our mind, our will, and our emotions must be trained to serve rather than to be served. Go with me now to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. These are familiar verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through verse 6. Hope you're there. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and that literally means soulish. They're not soulish, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then here he tells us what those strongholds are that we pull down. He says, uh, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. So the strongholds that, uh, that try to build themselves up in your life and in my life 
try to come into our thoughts and bring vain imaginations into our mind, our will, and our emotions. But, he says, since we don't war against that in the natural sense, but we war against that in the spiritual sense, we have the ability then to cast those strongholds down, to pull down those strong, and take every thought into captivity. That's what the Bible says. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we have, God doesn't tell us to do something that we can't do. And if we have trouble doing it, he'll help us do it because he works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Hallelujah. But he never tells us to do something that we cannot do. So Esau, the soulish realm, has to be trained to serve rather than to be served. Otherwise, if we do not do that, our life will be a mixture of that which is vile and a mixture of that which is precious. It will be a mixture of that which is temporal and a mixture of that which is eternal. And James describes that as a double-minded person. <laughs> And he said, a double-minded man or a person is unstable in all other ways. And let not that man think that he get, we're going to get anything from God. He's not going to receive from God. So we, we don't have to be double-minded. We don't have to, on the one hand, you know, be thinking those vile thoughts. And on the other hand, struggling to think those precious thoughts, those godly thoughts. We have the ability to pull those strongholds down. We have the authority to do it, to bring it into captivity. Activity. Example, have you ever witnessed someone you knew to be a Christian suddenly spew out something ugly when pressure was applied to their life? I've seen that, and you probably have too. That was the soul in control rather than the spirit. They allowed the soulish realm to control, and that is called rank carnality. Now, let's go back and Look at 1 Peter 2.11 again. I hope you're getting a little something out of this. 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, let me... I went right past it. Here we go. Chapter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I, besides, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Our souls then were created to serve and to reflect, reflect the spirit, not to serve fleshly lust. Luke chapter 1, verse 46, the Magnificat. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. What do we see here? We see the soul first rejoiced in the Lord, or the spirit rather, first rejoiced in the Lord, then the soul followed suit by magnifying the Lord. You see the, the key there? The spirit, our spirit magnifies the Lord, and then our soul follows suit with that. That's what she was saying. The soul demonstrating a clear reflection of what the spirit experienced. God places great value on the soul. Matthew 16, 26, Jesus said, For what is a man profited? If he gains the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So he get, places great emphasis upon it. Hallelujah. The renewed soul is precious in the sight of God. Luke 21, 19. In your patience possess ye your soul. Hebrews 6, 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What do we see here? We see hope and we see patience are greatly utilized by the soul. And they are both qualities that are produced in the spirit. That when we dominate with our spirit, they're transferred into the soul to be manifested as it is subjected to the spirit. The soul also needs the impact of the word of God. One of my favorite scriptures, and I've got many of them, and so have you, is John 1, 21. John 21, 21 says, And receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Now that word save there, I don't know, it's, it's the word sozo, you know, in the Greek. And you know what it means? It means salvation, healing, preservation, deliverance, and soundness. Five different characteristics of Salvation that belongs to you that are born again. 
So he said, receive the engrafted word, and it is able to bring salvation, healing, deliverance, preservation, and soundness to your soul, to renew your soul. So you renew your soul through the word, don't you? And he said, receive the engrafted word. That word engrafted in the Greek is emphuton. And it literally means to swell up. We get the, the English word plutocrat from it. It swells up within you to the point that your life is dominated by it and makes you a spiritual plutocrat as far as the devil's concerned because you're, you have the ability and the authority and the knowledge uh, to overcome him through the word of God. Proverbs 19.16 said, He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul. So on and on we see that God is vitally interested in the preservation and the renewing of our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our soul then needs a standard as a restraint to keep it in peace and keep it in rest. It needs standards and it needs restraints. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke or my standard upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find something for your soul. What is it you'll find for your soul? You'll find rest unto your soul. So we need standards for our soul. Jesus said our soul needs his yoke in order to stay in rest. This rest is necessary for the prosperity of the soul. Now go with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 25 through verse 28, here in the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, 25 through 28. Peter's preaching, and he said, For David speaketh concerning him, talking of Jesus. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not, shall not, should not be moved. Verse 26, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Okay, what's he talking about? Hallelujah. The hope that Jesus had in his spirit preserved his soul, keeping him in rest. He said, my heart, my spirit rejoices. My tongue was glad. My flesh or my soul and body, shall rest in hope because my soul is resting in the Lord. So he's literally saying, my heart, my spirit rejoices. My mind, my will, and my emotions are expressing this to the body. And this was all based on the Word of God because God had given his Word to his Son that he would not allow his soul to see corruption in hell. And so Jesus, on the cross, in all of that agony, was able to be at rest, at peace in his heart, at rest in his mind, will, and emotions, to the degree that he could look upon those that were crucifying him, and with love say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, because he was anchoring all of that to the word that was in his spirit, the promise that God had given, given to him in the Psalms that he would not suffer his soul to see corruption. He knew that he could not be in the grave more than three days, didn't he? Because on the fourth day, corruption would have set in. We know that in John 11, when uh, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary said he'd been there four days, and by now he stinketh because corruption would have set in on the fourth day. So Jesus knew, and that's why he had said to his enemies, the Pharisees, you destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. He knew. Now, hopefully none of us are ever going to be crucified. Hopefully none of us are ever going to get our head cut off. Uh, I, I don't really want to have to choose between either one of those. Do you? <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you're not going to face challenges to your spirituality, 
to your contentment, to your peace, to your joy, to your spiritual growth. It doesn't mean that you're not going to face some of those elements uh, in your life almost every day when you're out in the world and it's going to try to pollute your mind, your will, and your emotions and cause you to be diseased. And that's why you need these attributes and these truths in order to wage a proper warfare in your soul and be led by your spirit because the same promises that Jesus had in his spirit are in your spirits too. And uh, when you feed yourself on that word every day, you receive that engrafted word, it swells up inside of you and makes you, as far as the devil is concerned, a spiritual plutocrat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, consider David's as an example. Psalms 42 and 5, David said, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted or restless in me? Hope thou in God. He was talking to his mind, his will, and his emotion. And he was commanded it. Psalms 116, verse 7. He said, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt beautifully with thee, commanding his soul. Uh, I like, what is it, Psalms 103? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Uh, bless his holy name. So we're commanding our soul to bless him and to honor him. Our souls, then, our mind, our will, and our emotions come to rest when they come under the rule of our spirits. Our primary need for this rest is in our soul. It is in our thoughts because our thoughts basically determine our will and govern our emotions. It's so important for you to govern your emotions. You know why people get hooked on drugs? Why they get hooked on alcohol? Because they do not govern their emotions. Their emotions govern them, and they, their emotions get out of control. And, and they, in order to try to bring some kind of reconciliation out of that, they lean on something in the natural. And instead of bringing that rest and that peace, all it does is bring destruction. Some people, it seems, are not happy unless they have drama in their lives. The Lord showed me recently that drama comes out of emotions. So that means we, if we do what I'm trying to get across to us tonight, we can control the emotions. We can control the thoughts. We can control our mind, which means that we can control our emotions. And if we control our emotions, we're going to control about 98% of the drama that tries to come our way. Some people are not happy unless they're in drama. There's a difference between drama and crises. Crisis is reality. We have to, you have to deal with crisis. And the last crisis we're going to face is death. But uh, that's another message, and I'll deliver it to you some other time. But God gives us steps to show us how through Christ, every crisis that we will ever face has already been dealt with, and there's an avenue of escape, even death. Hallelujah. And that's resurrection. And, and if you are able, now get a hold of this. If you are able to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can believe for any miracle that you will ever need if you can simply believe in the resurrection. For if the same Spirit that, uh, dwell in you that raised him from the dead, it will quicken your mortal body. I like that. It will make your mortal body alive. Uh, so you, uh, God's even given us victory over every crisis that we will face. But it's, our biggest problem on a daily basis is dealing with drama. And drama comes out of emotions. If I'm not careful, Jeannie says that I'm lacking in patience. And she's probably right. Uh, if I'm sitting at a light and the guy in front of me is, texting or talking on his dumb telephone and the light changes and I've been sitting there you know and through a long light and he's still talking or texting 
and then just, uh, and, and my desire is to get on the horn and honk at him, tell him to get out of the way. And my, I, if I'm not careful, I start getting very stirred up and, and, and I bring drama upon myself because my emotions start getting out of control. And then just, uh, just before the light turns red, he suddenly wakes up and he shoots across and I'm still sitting there. So I get the privilege of going through the light again. <laughs> Those things are a battle for me. But, but that's, it shouldn't be that way. Because by and large, I'm still going to get to where I'm going in plenty of time, even though I had to wait on that dummy at the light and, and sit through it twice, you know. You see, I still, you, you can tell right now I have a problem with that. Those are, those are fleshly lust. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, oh, God deliver us from drama. Amen. Uh, now, I've got to hurry and finish this. <laughs> I want you to remember that Esau also rejected the birthright. And, the, and birthright in both the Old and the New Testament means firstlings or first fruits. So first fruits always belong to God, didn't they? We need then to offer up to God the first fruits of our thoughts, the first fruits of anything or anyone that we encounter in life. So the first fruits of every thought, of a thought of anything or of anyone that we encounter in life must be offered up to Him. When I think of Brother and Sister Stover, when I think of Brother and Sister Tharp, and I'm just going to pick on them, my first thought that I have of them is a pleasant thought. It's, it's a joyous thought because I'm in a wonderful relationship with these folks. And uh, if I knew you as well as I know them, uh, I'd feel the same way toward you. But I'll be honest with you, there are some folks that the first thought that I have of them, I have to battle to have a good thought about them. You're laughing, but you, you're, you're just like me. You, you're the same way. But uh, what does it say about Jesus? He saw 5,000 people saying, feed us, I'm hungry. I've been out here three days and I'm about to fast, feed me. And what does it say about them? The disciples said, send them into the village. You know, they got a Wendy's. They got a McDonald's down there. Send them, send them away. But the scripture said his thought was toward them of compassion. He had compassion. I want to be like Jesus, don't you? We went to Buffet Asia for lunch today. You ever been to Buffet Asia? And as we started walking in, uh, I like to go with Brother Lou because he pays the bill. So every time I think of Brother Lou, I have a good thought. <laughs> but as we were walking in, there was a man sitting on the rock right there by the door, and he had his, all of his stuff in a bag there, and he had a sign there that said, uh, help me, please. He's a veteran. And he's sitting there wanting people to give him. We're all going in to eat, and he's sitting there in the front of the restaurant evidently with no money. And I looked at him, and, and I just... It's hard for me to pass up somebody, like, even though they, they might be, you know, ripping me off. So we, we went on inside and uh, went to the table. Brother Lou had already paid, and we joined hands and pray. And all the time, Brother George praying, I'm thinking about that guy. He's got a cap on, and it said Duck Commander. Uh, anybody that wears a Duck Commander cap's got to be a pretty good guy in my book because I like, I like the Robinsons. You know, I like them. And I'm thinking, I should have given that guy something. So I, while we are got our eyes closed praying, I, I had a $5 bill in my pocket. So we, we started back to get our food. While they're getting the food, I slipped back outside, and I gave him that $5 bill. And I said, this is from the Lord. He loves you. Went back in, and after we got through eating and left, and we'd been in there quite a while, he's still sitting out there, but now he's drinking a Dr. Pepper. So maybe I was able to bless him with a Dr. Pepper. But uh, we were waiting on Brother George, and so I was 
went over and started talking to him, put my hand on his pad out to, you know, that he's a disabled veteran and he's trying to get the VA uh, to give him his uh, disability and they've already turned him down. And I talked to him about the Lord and he told me he was a believer. And then Brother George came out and we all started talking to him and we found out he was a philosopher too, didn't we? <laughs> he started giving us some, some, you know, some strategic plans for the government to put it, to put it, <laughs> but, but I mean, that was not a lot. But, but I'm glad that I had that kind of feeling. I, I have driven by somebody at a stoplight holding a sign and gone away and just can't get it out of my... I've actually turned around and went back and given them a little bit of money. because. Uh, and I believe that's a gift of God. My wife said she didn't want me to carry money because I give it all away. So you can, prob- you can generally buy me for less than $10, you know, that I'll give it away. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want my thoughts... Uh, I want the Lord to be the Lord of my thoughts. Hallelujah. When we give him our thoughts, the result is rest, peace, patience, and hope that will fill our souls. Hallelujah. When we allow him to rule in the midst of our thoughts, in our soul, we fulfill our part of the New Testament covenant requirements. For the covenant to be fulfilled, God must always be in the midst. And we looked at the covenant of Abraham last night in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis. And you can read that. We won't take time for that. And this allows the blessings of our covenant with God to be poured out upon us. Our souls then are looking to our spirit for direction and for purpose. Our spirit must be strong to provide this direction and this purpose. For our spirit to be strong, it must be full of the Holy Spirit, it must be full of obedience, it must be full of faith, and it must be full of the Word of God, and we must feed our spirit every day. Hebrews 4 and 12, final scripture. You know it well, and most of us can quote it, but let's go over there and read it. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner or a judge is what that means of the thoughts and the intents, and that literally is mind in the Greek, of the thoughts and the intents of the mind and of the heart. It says the soul can divide. The only thing that can divide between the soul and the spirit is the word of God because it is a sharp two-edged sword, isn't it? Uh, it, If it can divide asunder, then it must be what holds it together. So the soul then is joined to the spirit by the word of God. And when the spirit delivers the word to the soul, it makes the soul strong. And the soul serves the spirit instead of vice versa. When the soul is strong through the word of God, it does not yield to the temptations of the flesh as Esau did. John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Our soul must be in agreement with our spirit, and it must say the same thing as our spirit if we are to walk in the prosperity and the favor with God. 3 John 2 says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul doth prosper. May God add his blessing to the preaching of his word and give you and give me understanding is my prayer tonight. Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and His church, train them in the Word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.